This podcast was brought to you in association with Penguin India. Hello and welcome to yet another episode of the Kitabi Karwan podcast. Generally, I am not a huge fan of thriller fiction, but this book compelled me to change things. Written by the dynamic duo of Jay Shankar Krishna Murthy and Krishna Uday Shankar, this husband wife duo have come up with a terrific book with a supremely interesting plot which had me gripped right from the word go. Without giving anything away, let's jump right into the interview. Uh, Jay and Krishna, welcome to the Kitabi Karwan podcast. I'm quite excited to have both of you here. And for a lot of my listeners who know a bit about me, uh, I was very excited to know that Krishna's went to NLS, which is also another law school, and then ended up taking a different journey altogether, which is something what I'm doing as well. I went to NLU Delhi and now, well, <laughs> with Kitabi Karwan and what I do in my other life. And that's actually brings me to my very first question to both of you. Um, and that's something I always ask to people on my podcast because I always get interesting answers to this. Uh, Krishna, you're a, you've written like eight or nine books and Jai, this is your first uh, book from what I know in collaboration with her. Um, what I personally feel is that authors have started having a far more public personality than they had like say 15, 20 years ago, right? With the advent of social media or, you know, the internet, it just, I mean, I could look up and find out where you went to college. And well, there are stuff on there's stuff on your book club and stuff like that. But I always feel that people have a certain side to them that they keep hidden away for whatever various reasons, privacy or this thing. But uh, today, could you share just one side, one something about you that possibly people don't know about you? Maybe something associated with your writing side, maybe not. Whatever you feel comfortable sharing with our listeners, one thing each that maybe uh, people won't know if they just Google your name or like look you up. I guess uh, I think uh, one thing they would not know is that I have been wanting to write for four decades. So, you know. Oh, okay. So, okay, then that's, that's, that's quite something. And Krishna, something about you? So, I'm, I'm, I'm going to take a cue from that. Um, when I was a kid and people asked me what I wanted to be, my mm. two choices were writer or astronaut. <laughs> And okay, so I actually have follow up questions on both. Uh, why not pursue anything around like being an astronaut ever in life? Like how just how did you end up being a lawyer of all things? Because I was terrible at math. Uh, mm-hmm. And it's like, you know, 11th and 12th, you've got to do all the physics, maths and all of that. If you wanted to be a pilot, astronaut, anything yeah. of that sort. So very sadly, I gave up. But on the flip side, I can be anything I want now that I'm a writer. <laughs> that's true that that's so so true and jay this is fascinating to know like decades and you wanted to be a writer what stopped you i mean what when what took so long i just could not write i could only ideate mm-hmm. and uh, i could not complete the process so you okay. know this particular book also happened because i pitched the idea to krishna she yeah. liked it uh, then uh, she, what do you call, we discussed the plot and everything, but the whole writing was, yeah. she took it up. Right. Oh, yeah. So, so I'm cu- quite curious, uh, generally, uh, so Krishna, you've written eight books in the past, so you've had a lot of experience with uh, this entire process, uh, but Jay, what was your uh, inclination towards writing some sort of this uh, I don't know how to particularly classify this genre, but maybe a crime thriller is, I think, maybe I can best classify it as. Was there uh, always an intention to write like a thriller or what was it? What was it? Just some idea that popped up and you just kind of ran with it. I can think only of crime because I've been a crime buff like all along. So, you know, <laughs> I read a lot of either crime or it is usually some international espionage or, you know, like, uh, what do you call Cold War stuff, World War. Yeah. Yeah. Crime is something which is like, uh, you know, but since I don't have any other experience, crime is something which is something which I can easily think of as a plot. So, you know, so that's, the, I think I've not had any other ideas at all besides crime. It's it always been crime, that's it. Yeah. And Krishna, this was, like, I mean, I, I mean, I confess I haven't really read a lot of your work, but from whatever I know of it, it's quite, I mean, it's based on the Mahabharat and, you know, it's appears to be quite different from Far Side. Like I, I had an opportunity to read it and I, was, I really liked it, but it must have been a very different process for you as well, right? To kind of shift gears in that sense. Not 
not really because I think at the end of the day, but you're right. I mean, my first inclination, both in reading and writing or even watching on Netflix is going to be fantasy and uh, sci-fi. Yeah. And that is like my staple consumption mm -hmm. as well. And uh, that's what I've been writing all along. But the thing is, once you get into the story, mm -hmm. all that's changing is the rules of the world in which the story are set. People are the same, characters are the same. I mean, right. people still are the complex, nuanced mix of good and bad that they are in, whether it's in a fictional world or whether it's in the real world. So okay. it, it wasn't, uh, the, the writing process was not difficult in the sense of making that shift. But I think when what was challenging about the whole process is when you work with somebody like Jay, who is a very, very plot intensive person. Mm -hmm. It's the plot is so complicated. And I think the, the words I would have said to him most frequently throughout the process is, I don't understand this. Yeah. And you know, he would be like, okay, you're being argumentated. And I'm like, no, I really don't understand this. Because it would be such a complex and layered plot. Right. That was the challenge. Right. No, but I, I can imagine. And that that's the thing with crime thrillers. I think the more, and that's as you put it people are complex and hence all things particularly when it comes to crime thrillers they just create for more complex layers for people so uh, i'm again it's it, this is always talking to a writer duo in that sense is a very interesting uh, time because it's art appeals differently to different people right i mean i just Ryan, both of you spoke about how jay just likes is a crime buff and has been into that and you've been into fantasy and in that sense, art always appeals in different ways to people. People prefer different things. So what was your uh, writing process synergy like? I mean, you know, did you uh, have some ground rules set down that, okay, this is how we'll write or, you know, this is how it, things go through. There'll be a narration, then I'll write or vice versa. I mean, I'm just curious. No, <laughs> Um, the writing process involved a lot of screaming at each other. <laughs> um, it involved, uh, you know, to the point where we actually tried making rules like, okay, you know what? We won't discuss the book outside of the study room. So we won't discuss it while we're, you know, eating dinner together, or we won't discuss it while, uh, you know, in, in, in some other space, but that never works. Because randomly something will come up and, you know, one of us will shout to the other from one other room, hey, what about this? Right. And before you know it, it's gone somewhere else. But there was this point of time in which, you know, there's this like whole six by 10 cupboard, which was full of post-its because we were trying to both trying to track the whole thing together right. and literally storyboard the whole thing before writing. Right. So a lot of that was fun where, you know, the two of us used to just sit and stare at the post-its and... Uh, that but uh, yeah in, in, in general it was I think also because of our personalities it was a quite an argumentative process right so okay I mean but I mean the book turned out to be great so I mean all's well at the end but so I was actually this goes to the ideation stage my question was rather more along the lines of actually penning down the words right so did you follow a process therein and that's actually a, more of a question towards both of your writing personalities because, you know, mm. you have you have different ends of the spectrum. I mean, you had that classic Hemingway quote, right? Uh, write drunk, edit sober, and, you know, let the words flow through you kind of writers who will just wake up in the middle of the night and write down things. And then you have a lot of your disciplined writers who approach it as more of a mix of art and science. Like, you know, they set us out at a certain time, get in that space to write. So what works for the two of you? Uh, like, do you follow a schedule? Do you just write whenever? What gets you to put down the words on paper? I'm very, I'm actually a mix of the two. Okay. You know, there are the days where I have trouble starting, but I'm disciplined enough to sit and stare at the computer if nothing is happening also. There will be that discipline, but then there is just that sporadic thing that uh, takes off and, uh, you know, because Jay always says I have starting trouble, but once I get started, it's like the brakes don't work. Right. So um, that's how I do it. And I generally, what I think with the writing, we didn't really have during the writing process, a lot of back and forth. It was more like significant chunks or even versions. And that's, uh, that's usually because, you know, once I get into it, I'm carrying a lot of stuff in my head and it's not on paper. So yeah. anybody looks at a draft is going to find it messy because I've probably written one paragraph on page 10, 
then jumped all the way to page 200, come back into change something else. But I'm holding it in my head and it's not on paper. And somebody who sees it on paper is going to be like, this looks like rubbish. You don't even know what you're doing. But that's just how I work. So with everything, I prefer to bring things to a state before showing it even to my co-author. And Jay, what about you? What, what was your approach to this? Well, as I mentioned earlier, you know, I did not write. So, you know, I just prepared right. one synopsis of around 10 pages. Uh -huh. Somewhere in 2008, uh, I think. Oh, wow. So, so and uh, it's been lying in my computer. Like I had several synopsis like that. So, you know, I've been kind of like yeah. on and off to keep uh, wondering how to take it forward. I How to take it forward. I tried to find uh, professional writers or ghost writers to complete it. And, right. uh, you know, and then uh, it didn't really go smoothly. Mm -hmm. Then I, you know, appealed to my wife, who was kind enough to listen to some of the plots and she chose one of these topics. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, as I said, like, and uh, you know, she kind of, I did not interfere in writing. Her writing skills are far, far superior than mine. Like I just, uh, I don't write that well. So, I would uh, probably get to see probably once she has written 100 pages and then I would just go through it and then uh, if I had anything, I would just tell her probably plot wise only, nothing on structure or anything okay. or writing. So, and uh, and then we will obviously discuss, then she would complete it. I think it took a period of around one, one and a half years because she had, we go through cycles when she's able to write and when she's not able to write. Yeah. And I have, I have only option take it or leave it. Either I come. <laughs> yeah, but that, that's wow! I'm quite astounded that it was a twelve-year germination process from the synopsis to the publication stage. But uh, so the next thing that I wanted to actually talk to both of you about was, so you know, people always assume that nonfiction is the area where there's a lot of research involved. You know, while people are fact checking and everything, whereas fiction is just something that you know flows, which in my experience, at least, hasn't been the case. I mean, people have always, authors have always confessed about how much work or research is involved in even writing a fictitious piece of creating the backgrounds or the cities where you're hosting certain events. So what was that process like for you? Would it, was there actual, like, a, a lot of research or was this a lot more of an experience-driven writing where you incorporated just things that you've seen on your own? Probably a bit of research on that end and then kind of build it and just just to kind of flow with this i've always felt that people authors have struggled with certain characters a lot more or like associate with certain characters or kind of are able to draw their personalities into some of them so for both of you was were there any characters that kind of i know provoked extreme emotions maybe you absolutely loved that character or associated a lot with it or absolutely hated that character for whatever reason Oh, like we see the thing is, you know, uh, I did a little bit of research, but I, and I think I left the research part to Krishna. He is mm -hmm. like, a, you know, he is love research and, you know, that's one thing. Mm -hmm. Only thing we, what we tried was, we were like, we wanted to be very sure that it has to be rational. Right. There has to be a, whatever books that I've enjoyed the most is where like you don't generally kind of jump and say like a leap of faith and say like you know this is something which is total totally inconceivable or not rational at all or something like that so yeah. most of our arguments used to be that is the kind of research was basically like about the arguments about what why when how so arguments used to be like you always used to ask these four questions Right. One of these four questions. So the the research was for me or for to her to find out the way in a way it is satisfactory to both of us. Right. What about you, Krishna? What okay? So as a lot of the research work was, I don't know, outsourced to you in that sense. What was your take on this? No, I don't, it wasn't outsourced so much as you know. I just get fascinated by minutiae sometimes, and I'll spend hours 
researching yeah. them so you know sort of to this point this explanation you know we um we, we had this whole in the initial draft that there is you know the uh you know there is a murder that takes place and then the body is found x days later and that connects up to a lot of things that are happening x days yeah. later then i'll go in and i'll figure out the decomposition rate of a corpse that's in water <laughs> and i know totally unnecessary in, right in, in, I stop i'll just keep going <laughs> I don't know if it's totally unnecessary, but yeah, it, it just makes for some interesting Google searches. Yeah, so yeah, I think my search history would be very, very um, either very fascinating or scary if anybody ever pulled like it up. She did not was not ready to believe that you know people can buy mobile phones which cannot be traced. So I had yeah. to kind of find. Yeah, he had to yeah research burner phones and give that. Right. And, she was like, yeah. well, no, how do you get burner phones? In India, you need identity. Uh. I was. Oh God, man! Like this is. <laughs> then he did the whole research on burner phones and brought that yeah. in. And you know, I would be like, okay, if the corpse has been in water two weeks later, it needs to look like this. So our timeline has to shift. Uh, uh. So I think that's the kind of stuff. But that uh, that research was very uh, fascinating. In fact, it was quite enjoyable. No, but th- that's the thing. I think these are the things that stand out in a book. I think beyond a point of time, because we luckily or unluckily live in a world where there's a lot. publishing has become easier there are a lot of uh, fiction out there in the market and not just published work in terms of paper published there are online blogs there is i don't know podcasts and the, there's just so many ways of narrating the same art that you kind of trying to put down so in that sense identifying better works becomes uh, tougher and i think these are the kind of things that stand out when just as jay pointed out that uh, the more the kind of work that you enjoy is the work that's more nuanced more finely researched or at least stands true to what it is stand out for but uh, you guys neither of you mentioned the characters or which stood out for you what, what what were the most difficult ones or the easily lovable ones for you it might be a minor one as well it doesn't really matter that way no, i was not very like initially i think uh, see charu obviously was a character that uh, was a kind of like that's usually a standard character for me is a person who is rational mm-hmm. you know young rational and also like reasonably brave and mm-hmm. you know like you know that's usually how my plot lines work you know somebody who's able to take up the challenge when that's not something which is their mainstay so you know like a girl who is autism so that's my always favorite piece a very powerful female character is something which i love so in this particular case it was charu so yeah. but uh, like somebody like you know anand and all is something which krishna took a lot of time initial drafts and all she used to write quite a lot about his day and other stuff mm. and i used to be like what the hell man who really cares you know like you know so you know uh, like okay man just write police inspector or ex police <laughs> you know just like that so which is I not would- i think to do but as i'm saying like you know you're like a totally indifferent like these people don't yeah. matter which is totally incorrect because i think many people yeah. make this mistake yeah. of focusing only on the central characters and leaving not developing the others right yeah. so yeah. and what about you krishna so i think <clears throat> charu's character is what sort of sold the story to idea to right. me the very first time i heard it you know this uh In this girl who is and and it's it's a very real kind of bravery right it's not your mm. lara croft to bleeding i'm going around kicking mm. people bravery it's a very different true inner strength that could be found in you know any one of us so right. it's a very relatable but still something that is uh, there is that hero element to it and so i think her character was what uh, got me hooked to the book but uh, i I don't know. I just enjoyed creating David's character. I think that's just me. You know, it's <laughs> there, there's this whole uh, what, what is that thing about the counter uh, gender thing? I forget. Your the muse is always the other gender. I I forget what the technical name for it. Something something something. Never mind. Yeah. Yeah. But so I think I really enjoyed creating that character. I mean, just yeah. I was having fun. Yeah. So now I actually have a very pointed question for Jay. Jay, like I mean, I'm still stuck on the fact that you know. you had the synopsis for 12 years and it took these this entire time for it to convert into a book and you still didn't end up writing it you wanted always were looking for someone to outsource it to 
but so what is the reason you didn't choose any other medium like why not a web series or a movie or something of that sort why a book what was it about this medium that appealed to you for this particular story it's just a question of cost was if i could obviously produce a movie on my own i would have probably i'm still thinking about it only thing is i just right. don't have the money you know right. like i would only be the creative head and just outsource everything right and uh, now ask somebody to write the screenplay while i kind of oversee it and say you know like okay so, but uh, it's question of economic economics yeah, like no but, but the, uh, right yeah but if i'm i'm pretty sure i mean i i hope you guys already are looking for someone for out to i know a production house to work with you on far side because it will make for an interesting i know like a web series or movie i would i would like really like to watch it and luckily we're living in this i know golden age of ott in india where like everyone is just really willing to make good content okay right? but uh, i'll just take a step back and maybe let's let, let's just challenge a couple of my notions because i have always assumed that people who write are more often than not really good like really voracious readers as well you know bibliophiles is that true for both of you as well do you like to i mean are you guys people who read a lot and if yes what kind of stuff do you read i used to read a lot uh, i think till 10 10 years ago because like i went through i am uh, like around 54 so i started from like all the best sellers during my time like sydney sheldon like uh, frederick forsyth was my all time favorite author and mm-hmm. you know like it all is and uh, all those things and uh, agatha christie which is obviously like uh, you know because it is used to be like you can finish it off within 4 5 hours if you just start it so you know, and uh, so i used to read a lot but then uh, somewhere it kind of like uh, it paused but now i'm trying to pick it up again you know like these days i am trying to go back to the classics again because classics is something which i have tried several times but i could never go through it but now i have found audio book where somebody does the reading for me so again <laughs> outsourced, outsourced so you know. <laughs> that that seems to work perfectly for you outsourcing things and then using the benefit of it the enjoying the entire process that works beautifully for you what about you krishna what did you read a lot or do you still read a lot well, i don't read as much as i used to and as much as i should be reading um yeah. and when i read it's most of the time it's going to be fantasy and sci-fi okay. so very recently i finished a binge reading all of lee bardugo's works and i was like hooked onto it totally mm-hmm. uh like did the books in two days one day kind of thing and now now what am i reading i know i have a couple of books open somewhere but i'm really not reading them i'm like being more yeah. lazy yeah. and uh, watching rather than reading it's i think yeah. it's a sad state of us right yeah i and but i think this uh, complaint about not being able to read as much as we used to earlier i think that's just true true for everyone at every point of time i think i mean i find myself one thing that i used to read a lot more when i was younger and i think i mean that's just the advent of how the world around us has ch- changed that much i mean i think when you were younger and i was younger like when well internet was at its in india at least was at its dial up stage right i mean um like my sister I, i had this very interesting conversation with my sister a few days ago because she was by the time she was 5 or 6 you know and when she could start comprehending and working on computers and stuff broadband was at home so i mean she does not yeah. know of like a modem while a world like waiting disconnecting the phone to kind of go to, on the internet so i mean it's been an exponential leap in that sense there's just been so much more art just in general to consume like even if you're not say say even if you're watching your crime documentaries there's just way too many of them as compared to what was available earlier right but uh, i mean this is kitab ki karwan so i would want to focus more on books i strongly always believe i don't like asking people what their favorite book is because i don't think a people can have one favorite book ever but uh, i do believe that books or i know in general art has a lot of impact on people right and there are often the stand out books or art books that have impact on i know it could be like some book that you read when you were 15 and that kind of changed the way you approach relationships in life or maybe a non fiction book you read that kind of changed your perspective on how you evaluate things in life so were there any such books which you guys read over the years and what were they and okay 
So um, this is weird, but I actually, I think I must have been around six or seven, maybe um, somewhere in that this thing. When I read this book, I have never been able to find again. It is called It's Always Dark for a Blind Man. I remember the okay. title. I remember the story. I have never found it anywhere, even in this age of online. It's a children's book. It's some uh, swashbuckling adventure kind of book. But for some reason, that book just struck, stuck with me for the longest time. So I remember that book very, very clearly. Um, later on, I think the book that has made a huge impact, I mean, no logic why, has been uh, Siddhartha by Herman Hess. Mm -hmm. Then uh, I've always been an Asimov fan, despite now all the controversy that is around his name. I can't deny mm -hmm. that I've enjoyed his works very much. So, uh, you know, the first the first time I uh, read the, the th first three of the foundation books, that was like, I was like, wow, creating a world like this is what I want to, I want to grow up and do this someday kind of thing. Right. So, yeah, I think these, these are some of the books that have uh, really hit me. Um, yeah, there was also one cartoon book about, a, you know, a, a T-Rex that was on a rampage. Okay. I really liked that one. It, it was, <laughs> you know, one of the first sci-fi uh, set in outer world. And then there are two T-Rexes which are facing off and it's, it's a very gory kind of cartoon book. Right. Um, and that one I managed to find later. But yeah. Okay. 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 And yeah, I mean, I can imagine like if it's always dark for a blind man being a book that will impact a six-year-old a lot. I mean, that's just the, the title in itself makes you wonder a lot. Uh, what about you, Jay? Like, what were there any books such as these for you? Me, like, um, Fountainhead was a major influence. Like, for uh -huh. me, Ayn Rand, uh, Fountainhead was like right. something which has had a lasting impact on me. And uh, so, otherwise, uh, like, uh, you know, uh, the other books and all have been more, what do you call, having an impact in terms of educating me in life in times of like, you know, George Orwell and all has mm -hmm. been a very powerful force in terms of, you know, like exposing me to mm -hmm. uh, realities of the world and other stuff. And um, uh, yeah, these are the like character-wise influential, it has, I would say it is uh, Ayn Rand, Fountainhead. Right. No, I, I, yeah, yeah, please. Sorry, no, I, I just realized one shared book, which we both love, but we are forgetting to mention is the whole Calvin and Hobbes series. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. And I think like we, yeah. when we met, that was one of the first things we bonded over a lot. And yeah, uh, yeah. yeah that, that guy's a genius. And we just like love that absolutely. world and that thing. No, absolutely. Like Calvin and Hobbes is something I like, I really love that entire comic strip and like, I mean, the books in the entire collection i think in fact uh, in college uh, when way back when i used to torrent stuff also <laughs> i i think i'd found the entire collection somewhere and i downloaded it and i kept it and it's something that i still cherish and like go through once in a while and and it's it's great that you mentioned the uh, the fountainhead because that's also a book that i read in my teenage years and i mean it didn't really make a lot of i mean i read it in my early teenage so i mean it wasn't it was too a bit too heavy for me but then i read read it again like around 17 or 18 and just started hitting more and it, it's the it's interesting that you mentioned Asimov as well because that's the next question I wanted to get to because in Ayn Rand's context or his context or even when you consider JK Rowling like we today live in a world where we're not really I mean our favorite authors for whatever reasons don't necessarily end up being in the best of lights right there sometimes they make certain comments or certain we find out certain things about their personalities or certain actions they take which probably challenges us as human beings makes us think about what they're kind of propagating or when you kind of later on in life realize what they're talking about makes uh, I don't know that isn't in line with what you're saying so the kind of the question that I'm trying to ask is uh, are you a believer of uh, separating the art from the artist or do you believe that uh, I don't know it's somehow uh, the art is very intrinsically linked to the artist and hence uh, I don't know if you kind of avoid someone's work simply because you do not agree with his or her uh, philosophy or the kind of lifestyle or views they're espousing okay I see this is something I'm still struggling with 
mm-hmm. because uh, you know it's it's very easy to say when you're just thinking about someone where you don't feel personally very impacted or hurt by the actions in question so maybe somebody makes a dumb comment and you're like oh god it's just a dumb comment man and forget it i don't agree but forget it and you move on it's easier whereas let's say you have some really reprehensible things that come to light about and it's it's happened we've had authors who in called out later for being uh, um you know harassers pedophiles even and then you can't just not react to that but so i think the long story short is i'm really struggling but one of the things i believe strongly in is that disagreeing is not reason enough to dislike someone's art if we had to consume art we only agreed with then we really wouldn't be enjoying ourselves very much yeah. so disagreement is fine but i think then you get into the question of where is the line i may not agree with you politically but if you are let's say your political views are extreme it's not about what they are it's the fact that they are extreme on any spectrum what should we be doing then or if you have been you know um <clears throat> you've been proven guilty of some very reprehensible or uh, an act that has hurt others what is the thing that i don't know i can ignore it mm-hmm. but at the same time i don't know i know enough about how i feel to have a stand on this whole thing i at least an articulate stand of saying yes i am for separate no i'm not for separate i i really don't know i think i'm just going to be very human about this and say oh my god i never want to read this person again when i feel that way or you know okay i don't agree but maybe right i'm i think it's going to be a very this call is going to be based on me and how i feel and not what i ha- and not a position or stand i can take it may evolve into a position over time but right now it isn't right and qj what's your take on this no i think uh, i consider that like uh, people who write or any any form i think the art and the artist are a intrinsic personality mm-hmm. for them for me it is separate for me i am only interested in the art not the artist background so i am like i kind of don't agree to ian rand's the way she kind of you know like kind of goes on about capitalism and you know fully denigrate socialism and other stuff but for me that is not enough for me to disobey or like you know make fountain head mm-hmm. less appeal less appeal some and even let's say if it comes to let's say some bad things do come to light but i cannot just throw away the art with the artist because i kind of kind of i feel they are together for the artist for me they are separate nice. actually if i could just jump in on that i think you know maybe you because he's helping me sort of i think clarify my stance in my head Mm-hmm. i think what i'm hearing you say or at least what i'm taking away is that once you've consumed the art it's part of you not necessarily the artist right. and as a writer right. that's also what i feel right that you know i'm doing half the writing the other half mm-hmm. has to happen when the reader creates that world in right. their head right. so maybe at that point it's the art we have a claim on the art that right. allows us to make it ours rather than say this is invested right. only in the artist and therefore take it or right. leave it yeah. so yeah, yeah. thank you yeah no i i mean these are two really valid points about a being human about the process and kind of it having an individual approach and b that well the moment what i think jay was trying to say and you articulated it that well you the art and the artist are the same when it's being generated but the moment you consume it they're separate and it becomes a part of you what uh, i mean and i'm not looking for an answer here anyway it's just something i was i started grappling with it i used to be uh, quite similar to you in that sense uh, taking a more individualistic approach in it but what happened was uh, about a few months ago i hosted a giveaway on my instagram page about and some for something i even forgot what and i collaborated with someone and there were harry potter bookmarks that were being given away right and uh, so someone reached out to me and said that you know you shouldn't be promote you know jk rowling made certain comments you would be supporting her if you're doing this it's like no and i i made a very similarish argument that you know i kind of separate her art or her work from her and for me it's about my nostalgia for it or what people associate with that story 
and uh, a very interesting point that came up was well about how do you look at it in today's sense where people derive royalties and you know from their trademarks and things like jk rowling benefits from harry potter till date like not just beyond her book sales but you know popularity of the franchise and that goes for a lot of other things that maybe like someone's book get turned into a web series or movie they earn like money from that so where does that stop you know like would you then because you're indirectly supporting the lives and even i don't have an answer i'm not expecting one it's just one of those things that you throw out there and wait or think about to kind of get uh, an answer into but um we are unfortunately running out of time for the podcast so i'll just wrap this up with one final question for both of you uh what's next uh, are we can we expect another book sometime soon are there other synopsis is in on your uh, laptop jay or is there a web series or a movie or anything that the two of you are working on maybe together maybe individually whatever if you could tell us like uh, krishna had helped me find uh, another co-author so that uh, that book is uh, it's a psychological thriller it is uh, currently with anuj bari so like mm-hmm. you know he's trying to uh, get a distrib- uh, publisher for it there is one more which i got i finally found a professional decent professional writer mm-hmm. who has managed uh, to write that book so that book again again i'll be pitching to some publisher so now currently i am you know writing two other synopsis obviously and you know like <laughs> going to again uh, look for writers yeah right and what about you krishna so so yeah i mean um i actually don't have a manuscript in progress at the moment i have ideas and i'm trying to figure out which one is going to wake me up in the middle of the night and make me write it what is keeping me busy is um screenplay work both in terms of work on we have some interest in far side and then we have some interest in also in the other uh, the, the psychological thriller that jay was mentioning called mind games so i'm sort of trying to do the screen conversion for that that's being busy plus you know i'm part of another screenwriting gig which is not directly but it's still related to my books but not quite directly and can't talk about it more right now but uh, yeah and then of course with that and the day job it's uh, <laughs> you know some more writing going on well i really wish to see like more of your work soon out there and probably you can talk about it on another episode soon when it comes out but uh, best of luck to both of you and thank you so much for uh, joining us on the podcast today it was really fun having you it was a pleasure being here siddha thank you so much for having us it's been a wonderful conversation i mean it actually doesn't even feel like a podcast right it just feels like <laughs> chatting with you thank you so much yeah, for that lovely yeah, thank you so much see yeah, i really enjoyed it yeah thank you so and much and uh, all the best to you in your yeah. uh, your body call in uh, kitabi karawan and other all your ventures all your ventures <laughs> thank you so much thank you thank you bye 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 if you enjoyed this podcast please check us out on all our social media platforms we are available across all podcasting platforms on youtube on instagram you can find us at the rate kitabi karawan on instagram or just search kitabi karwan on google or a platform of your choice and you'll find us we carry out instagram lives giveaways we talk about books we talk to bibliophiles talk to authors and basically try and create a readers world through all of our platforms do check us out and don't forget to like share and subscribe thank you